So, a few years ago, I found myself sitting in a genetic counselor's office, helping a researcher diagram this beautiful little pedigree chart of my family and the misfortune and misery of the numerous cancer diagnoses that we had endured. I had cancer. And two years prior, if I don't cry, my youngest brother died from cancer at age 23. And weeks before my diagnosis, my uncle and my cousin's little boy were both diagnosed with cancer. I had just had a baby, of course. <laughs> and I worried that I had just created this new, beautiful little life that would one day have to face the fear and the pain of a cancer diagnosis of herself. And at the time, it seemed evident that my family had some kind of genetic condition or a predisposition for this disease. And so I went to see this genetic counselor in hopes of gaining some insight, understanding some answers, possibly. But also, I was hoping that maybe my family's experience could contribute to the understanding of this familial disease pattern. And so, as this researcher finished up this lovely little hand-drawn diagram of my pedigree chart, the genetic counselor came in and um, he carefully looked at this chart and he was really quiet. And you know that moment in the movies where it's like the drum roll. This is a dramatic moment. You know that something big is about to happen. And so I was really nervous and I thought, okay, prepare myself for this horrible answer and life, more life changes. That's not exactly what happened. The counselor, the only words that came out of his mouth were, science can't prove that your cancers are related at this time, but make sure to come back when someone else in your family is diagnosed with cancer, and we'll reevaluate your case. Okay, um, okay, okay, I was stunned. I was left in this counselor's office with a box of tissues. I was angry. I experienced cognitive dissonance at its finest. I did not believe this scientist that was supposed to have answers for me didn't have answers. But I am not a geneticist. And so, I remember going home that day very clearly and crying a lot and I did what I think most of us here do when we have these big questions and the answers that we are given are less than sufficient. I fell back on what I knew. I fell back on what I could understand. I'm a geographer. I have a background in anthropology and when my brother had died, I dug into the literature, I dug into the research to understand his disease, and I found this geographic component, environmental pollution exposure, that could have potentially caused his disease and then his death. But in my immediate family situation, I couldn't draw on what I knew. Me, my uncle, and my cousin's little boy, each of us had very different cancers, none of which were brain cancer. And in addition to that, we had never lived anywhere near each other to experience a shared environmental pollution exposure. And so I had to grapple with the really difficult idea that I was not seeing a familial disease pattern. I was living some horrible random chance. It did not sit well with me. And so I did what I do. I dug back into the research, and I was heartened when I came across the works of a Dr. Michael Skinner at Washington State University. 
Dr. Skinner studies how our genes interact with our environment. Dr. Skinner and scientists like him have found that indeed our genes, based off of some environmental signal, can switch on or off, so to speak. And under the right conditions, if this exposure occurs before you have children, there is a potential that you can pass that on through your genes to your kids. And this includes disease. Let me give you one geographic example that I think will help clarify what I'm saying here. So in 1980, two amazing scientists, Dr. Lars Olav Bygram and a Dr. Marcus Pembry, studied this small and remote village in Sweden that through the 19th century was known for going through severe feast and famine food conditions. Now the amazing thing about this little village in Sweden is that they kept meticulous records. They were excellent record keepers. They even recorded how much food was available for families through these times. And so what these two scientists did after they had acquired their information, they tracked down the descendants, which were the grandchildren of those that lived in this village, and they compared the health and longevity of these grandkids to the food availability of their grandparents that lived in this village through these feast and famine times. And what they found was remarkable. It wasn't magic but it was remarkable. They could find a direct association, a strong correlation between the amount of food their grandparents were able to consume before adolescence. Specifically, grandparents that experienced more famine conditions before adolescence passed down genes that allowed their grandchildren to live longer, healthier lives. Famine longer, healthier lives, okay? Grandparents that feasted, that had more food available to them, actually had grandkids that lived shorter, less healthy lives. For me, the light bulb had turned on, and we know now that this is something called epigenetics. We know that we have the ability, that our genes have the ability to switch on and off based off of environmental exposures, and that is what was being witnessed in this village. For me, for my family situation, the light bulb had turned on, and I had to ask myself, okay, having this new information, even if it was just for me to cope with the situation, if I could map my ancestors over space and time, all the way down to me, I could potentially deduce an environmental exposure that has caused my current familial disease pattern of cancer. And this is something that I'm calling geographic legacy. And so today, I am a PhD student in medical geography, and that is a real thing. <laughs> Not kidding. And I take the data sets of historic environmental data, and I combine that data with family pedigree data from the Utah Population Database housed at the Huntsman Cancer Research Institute. I bring these pieces of information together and I recreate geographic legacies of families in hopes of finding some association between these environmental exposures and our disease outcomes in families. And so it is my hope that geographic legacies become commonplace in our medical research. But it is my dream that geographic legacies become commonplace for all of us but for familial disease research. So I know you're all on the edge of your seats. I want you to know that I'm cancer-free today. Thank you. My little girl, 
turned eight just a couple days ago, and she's healthy and happy. But my uncle, who suffers from multiple myeloma even today, he is one of the longest living survivors of his cancer. And so he is continually being studied for his longevity. And my cousin, who was just a little boy at the time of his diagnosis, is here today in the audience, and he is a teenager now, and he's healthy as well. Thank you. Thank you.